lovely to see so many people here this evening. My name is Megan Sweeney. I'm faculty in the theology department and the director of the Pulse Program for Service Learning. I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to this lecture by Dr. Thea James. This evening's lecture is co-sponsored by the Park Street Corporation Speaker Series in Health, Humanities, and Ethics and the Pulse Program in celebration of our 50th anniversary year of educating students for social justice. The Park Street Corporation Series was founded in 2016 with the help of a general request from the Quinn family. This gift aligns the late Father Quinn's interests in social justice and ethics with the mission of Boston College by bringing to campus local, national, and international leaders to address timely issues in the intersecting fields of health, humanities, and ethics. As the Pulse program was planning our 50th anniversary, anniversary this year, we sought to partner with departments whose educational mission for social justice aligns with ours. The Park Street Corporation series is a natural choice in this regard, and we are delighted by the opportunity this evening to work together. We are also grateful for the financial support of the Institute for the Liberal Arts. The next Park Street Corporation Speaker Series event will feature a lecture by Dr. Gregory Zimmet, Hard Choices, Ethical, Political, and Pragmatic Challenges Around HPV Vaccine Delivery, which will be next Thursday, February 6th, in Gasson 100 at 7 p.m. The next Pulse 50th anniversary event will be our celebration weekend on March 27th and 28th, featuring a variety of speakers and panelists. Please go to our website for more information, bc.edu slash pulse. After Dr. James's lecture, there will be a question and answer period. I would invite everyone to remain through the Q&A as it can be disruptive uh, when folks leave, but also sometimes some of the best conversation happens during the Q&A, so there's always something to learn. Dr. Thea James, MD, is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Boston Medical Center, Boston University School of Medicine. She also serves as the Vice President of Mission, Associate Chief Medical Officer, and Co-Founder and Director of the Violence Intervention Advocacy Program at EMC. Dr. James is a founding member of the National Network of Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Advocacy Programs. As Vice President of Mission, Dr. James works with caregivers throughout BMC. Additionally, she has primary responsibility for coordinating and maximizing BMC's relationships and strategic alliances with a wide range of local, state, and national organizations, including community agencies, housing advocates, and others that partner with BMC to meet the full spectrum of patient needs. Dr. James is a pioneer in moving medical care to a whole person approach, which recognizes the impact of the social determinants of health in patient health outcomes. She was a driving force behind BMC's unprecedented investment of $6.5 million in affordable housing initiatives. A graduate of Georgetown University School of Medicine, Dr. James completed an emergency medicine residency at what is now Boston Medical Center, where she was chief resident. Dr. James's passion is in public health, both, both domestically and globally. She is a supervising medical officer on the Boston Disaster Medical Assistance Team, which has responded to several disasters in the US and across the globe. She has deployed to post 9-11 in New York, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, Iran after the earthquake in 2003, and Haiti after the earthquake in 2010. Dr. James is 2008 awardee of Boston Public Health Commission's Mulligan Award for Public Service, and a 2012 recipient of the Suffolk County District Attorney's Role Model Award. She received the Boston Business Journal Healthcare Hero Award in 2012 and 2015. She was 2014 recipient of the Schwartz Center Compassionate Care Award. The Boston Chamber of Commerce awarded Dr. James with the Pinnacle Award in 2015, which honors women in business and the professions. We're sensing a theme here. <laughs> and this past spring, the Massachusetts Public Health Association honored Dr. James for her extraordinary commitment to bring public health principles and partnerships to the practice of medicine. It is an honor to have Dr. James 
with us this evening at Boston College. And please join me in welcoming her for her lecture, Medicine for Mission, Shifting the Paradigm. Thank you so much, everybody. It's really an honor to be here this evening. And um, I want to, uh, I, can't, I can't express enough what an honor it is to be here. It feels like, I feel like um, being a professor, uh, in, a, in a college is like being a parent, you know, in terms of how students, um, you know, evolve and become shaped and are imprinted. So it's a true honor to, to be here today. And I also want to say, I'm not in the Department of Geriatrics. That's just <laughs> poor editing. And so uh, I'm just saying that just so you don't get confused by anything. And so um, what, you know, what I'd like to do today is sort of give you um, some insight into how I started to evolve myself over the years of being in the emergency department. Tell you a little, about, a little bit about the imperative for paradigm shift um, and uh, basically was a transformation in Medicaid reimbursement in Massachusetts and talk a little bit about um, what it's going to take for that transformation to actually occur and be sustainable. And last, I'll give you some examples of some of the things we're doing at BMC uh, as we start on that journey. This here, um, um, let me first say that, maybe I should go back to this first. Emergency medicine provides you with unique insight into human nature, the human condition, and all of what constitutes life. And I think the, the greatest insight I have learned over the years is that given any opportunity, people will not choose suffering. And what the way that I've learned most of this is, is just listening to people, because people show up in the emergency department with a range of emotions, fear, <coughs> angst, sadness, and sometimes even anger. But if you are just listening to them and let them get it all out, acknowledge you, hear what they're saying and what matters to them, you actually see something happen right before your eyes in terms of their perspective. Their whole demeanor changes right in front of your eyes. And it changes to something that is a lot more helpful. And um, I always in, have engaged patients to help me understand the root causes of their instability, particularly when it's perpetual instability. Like, vicious cycles of instability. I always ask the patients. And so um, emergency medicine is fascinating. It really, really is fascinating if people are really um, paying attention. And so I wanted to show you this slide. You probably already know this, but the United States spends more money in healthcare than any country in the world. But our healthcare outcomes are the opposite. You know, if you look at that slide, you'll see you know, we're the black line up there, but our health outcomes are way down, one up from the bottom. It's, it's pretty bad. And uh, even today, it's pretty, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. And, you know, we've begun to look a little bit uh, at what is driving that, what's the cause of that. Well, one thing that um, got our attention in this state, in Massachusetts, is the Medicaid cost curve trajectory over the last decade. And it continued to go up and up and up, um, almost like 40% of the entire state budget, which basically took away uh, money from other things, like education and other things we need in the state. And up until March 1st, 2018, the reimbursement model for patients who, or for hospitals that were taking care of patients who were insured by Medicaid was a fee-for-service model, which meant that whatever patients showed up with, no matter how many times they showed up in the emergency department or how many times they got admitted, and I mean multiple times, people would get paid for it. You know, hospitals would get paid for it. And you know, on some level, it didn't give people an incentive to sort of unpack that and understand what was driving that, that constant instability in people. Um, but then, because of the cost curve, uh, Medicaid said, well, you know, we don't want to do that anymore. We don't want to use a fee-for-service reimbursement model. We're going to shift to value-based care or capitation, which meant that instead of paying you for whatever service you provided for a patient, you were going to get like an allowance, a certain amount of money per patient per month. So if you really think about that, it is a financial imperative to, to decrease 
multiple admissions because you're not going to get paid for 25 visits a year for the emergency department. You're going to uh, eat the cost if you run out of money and you're not able to contain that. So I thought it was one of the greatest things that, that has ever happened because now we have to understand what is at the root cause of people being chronically unstable and perpetually unstable. And so we have a greater risk um, for our patients. We have a greater responsibility for them. And Massachusetts formed these things called ACOs, Accountable Care Organizations, where the providers, the healthcare systems, everybody is responsible for the patients who come in the emergency department. And I want you to take a look at this slide for a moment. And honestly, you can put almost anything as a title. I mean, really, just think about it. You can put almost anything as a title, and demographically, it will fall out like this. You know, it's always going to be blacks worse than Latinos, than Asians, than whites. You know, whatever you put up there. It's so much to the point where I don't think people even wonder about it, they just accept it. It's like, this is what you expect. But, in, but the thing about it, in healthcare, these things really, really matter. Because there's intersectionalities tied up in that, and they directly drive people's health and health outcomes. And what that is looking at right there is looking at socioeconomic gradients and um, the health of uh, people who are between the ages of 25 and 74 by race and looking at education attainment. So the lower your education attainment, the worse off your health is. And the same thing for income. And not only for children, but also for parents, because children are merely the beneficiaries of the resources their parents have. So if you have lower income, you have your health uh, status is worse. And so um, I, I flip back to that slide because it's in the wrong place. It shows up again someplace else. So uh, Dr. Sandro Galea is the dean of the School of Public Health at BU. And he did this study a few years ago looking at T-stops and looking at these various different things in t at T-stops. So in this one, he's looking at the percent of families that live below the, the poverty line. And you know, living below the poverty line, you know, they set this thing every year, and it's, it, it's about like how much money, um, say you say a family of, I don't know, three people, um, the poverty line might be a family of three people making a total income of like $20,000 a year, or something like that. And so, um, if you look at these various different T-stops, there's not a ton, a ton of difference in between where they are, but there is a difference in um, where they are and what the, uh, the, the percent of people who are below the poverty line. And the same thing uh, in premature death rates. All associated you know, with, if you think about the definition of social determinants of health, all connected to that. And then again, education attainment, you know, looking at uh, the level of education people attain at these different T-stops, and homicide rates. But the clincher for all these things, the, 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 you know, what underscores all these slides is this one, because those yellow highlights there are healthcare centers, healthcare systems, you know, in Boston. Boston likes to tout itself as the medical mecca, you know, um, of healthcare, but they're having absolutely no impact on those previous slides, no impact. And a lot of it is because of the way you know medicine is designed and how we're taught to think about medicine and um, what we're taught to focus on. But I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. And at BMC, you know, we've had a tradition of always, you know, exceptional care without exception. But we've had a tradition of. Um, opening our doors to everyone, no matter their ability to pay, no matter who they are. And we have created lots and lots of uh, programs over the decades. As I was telling the group earlier that, you know, we've created uh, programs that have been disseminated around the country. They've become mo uh, national models. And, you know, there's no shortage of them. Here's a few. I couldn't even fit them all on the slide, quite frankly. And what a lot of them have done, some have, you know, altered people's life course. And, uh, and others, and probably a majority of them, are basically sort of filling gaps for people. Yeah, and I'm saying filling gaps for people versus eliminating gaps. Because when you're filling gaps, unless you're filling it, there's always gonna be a gap. 
doesn't really like alter the life course of people, doesn't give people an opportunity to be independent and self-sufficient and having opportunities to, for economic mobility and opportunities to build wealth. So not so long ago, I began to ask um, myself, well, what is the role of a safety net hospital, quite frankly? Is it charity or is it equity? Because charity is charity <coughs> in perpetuity with no end in sight and no transformation in sight, whereas equity is people being able to achieve at their highest levels and greatest desires. And there are many things that have uh, gotten in the way of that when you think about uh, those neighborhoods that I just showed you on the T-stops. You know, when people, when structural barriers get in the way of, of um, people being able to achieve at their greatest um, levels and highest desires, I mean, people, uh, it, it can't help but lead to poor outcomes for people. And so doctors started to take it a little bit serious when the CDC created this um, health impact pyramid because in medical school, you're taught that the things that have the greatest impact on life or on health are the things at the top, telling patients to exercise and eat well and take their medications and things like that. But when you are faced with limited resources and you're having to make tough decisions every single day about what you're going to do with your limited resources, you know, when you're having to decide, well, do I use my limited resources to pay for rent, pay for utilities, feed my family, or do I use my limited resources for a copay, for a medical appointment, or for a prescription, or for transportation to a medical appointment? It's an easy decision for those folks. Health and healthcare will always rank secondary to survival. And meanwhile, perpetual cycles of um, uh, ER visits, hospital admissions, poor health outcomes, and high costs persist because those are just downstream consequences of root causes upstream, like insecurities in housing and income and education and, and things like that. And so people wind up um, not having the ability to even prioritize health. But uh, so doctors are taught to focus on disease. So doctors are focusing on disease, doctors are chasing disease, patients are chasing life, and the two never line up. And meanwhile, those perpetual cycles of instability just continue. So this is basically just a definition of social determinants of health. And you know, essentially the condition, conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And these external forces that impact whether or not people will in fact be able to achieve at the levels they want. And so, I was just talking about uh, resources and prioritization, but I want to talk about the notion of upstream and downstream. And so, I just want to make sure people understand, you know, what the notion of upstream and downstream is. Well, when I first started um, telling this to medical residents, ER residents, and any kind of um, doctors in training, I would talk to them about um, walking along a stream, and say maybe you're walking along a stream and you see you know, children floating down the stream with broken arms. <coughs> well, you can stand there and like pick them up all day long, you know, for charity, if you're doing charity or whatever, you can stand there and pick them out all day long, but until you go upstream to figure out where that's coming from, you never have a chance of not only not mitigating it, but not, but not a chance at all of eliminating it. And so if in fact we have to, we want to mitigate and eliminate these cycles of instability, we actually have to focus upstream. And a lot of people will say things like, well, is that our role you know, in medicine? But the thing of it is, is that if you don't address those things, you're not doing anything anyway. So I don't know, you know how one can continue to do it. And it even like, impacts things like um, uh, life expectancy. So the difference in life expectancy between where BMC is um, adjacent to multiple communities of color and like a mile and a half up the street is 30 years. It's crazy, it's insane, but it's 30 years. And as we create these interventions and these various different um, innovations and things like that, uh, not inter interventions, but more like creating inno inno innovative interventions, we have to like really understand 
and be conscious of and learn from the historical factors and historical systems that created these structural barriers. And you only have to go back to, from my perspective, one decade to you know, get some insight into that. Like the 1930s and looking at the New Deal when um, President Roosevelt was trying to resuscitate America from what I call the ravages of the Great Depression of 1929. And one of the things he did was to try to create um, opportunities for wealth building for people. And one of the most common pathways to wealth building in our country is home ownership because of the familial and generational benefits of home equity. So it was a fantastic plan. It was a great plan. But in the exact same decade, <coughs> he created these policies that led to redlining, where red lines were drawn all across this country throughout communities. And if you live behind those red lines, you did not have access to that wealth building pathway. In fact, you couldn't even access the financial services that would put you on that pathway. And I always think that at that point in time, two distinct socioeconomic groups were established and remain fixed to this day. An example of that is the medium, uh, median net wealth gap in Boston of $247,000 for whites and $8 for blacks. And then, this is what redlining looks like. And these are the areas that are our catchment area for BMC, all of which were you know, behind red lines back then. And then in that same decade, there was uh, the system of complicated system of public housing. And people always say, well, it was well intended. And it probably was well intended, for sure. And, but the thing is, I think we missed an opportunity back then to have, to, to instead of it being like it was, but to create it as a transient stop that was designed to enable people to gain the tools, the resources, and the stability that they would need to then move on to self-sufficiency and financial independence. Instead, some um, public housing is associated with these regulations that limit the amount of income people can earn without losing their public housing and other subsidies they have, unless they agree to pay more money to remain in public housing. And I think people understand that that's not exactly a, uh, a good financial plan for a way out of public housing. And, um, you know, one of the things we're working with, one of the things we're doing at BMC right now is working with a company um, trying to, uh, you know, find a way to incorporate them in our operations, a company called Compass Working Capital. And what they do is they are leveraging a HUD program called Family Self-Sufficiency Program. And what they do is they work with people who live in public housing if the housing authorities will allow them to work with them. And Boston <coughs> Housing Authority has recently opened up all of their properties um, to Compass Working Capital. At first they were only allowing maybe 200 and some odd people out of a total of 12,000 uh, residents to, to, be, to avail themselves to Compass Working Capital. But now it's open to everyone. But at any rate, um, what they do is people can earn more money. Because you, know, you know people like turn down raises, turn down jobs, turn down opportunities for careers because they don't want to trip what they call you know, uh, this thing will have you like falling off the cliff, you know, so, um, but what they will do is, they, any money you earn up to the limit, uh, any money you, learn, oh, you earn over the limit goes into escrow, and it goes into escrow for home ownership. There's also the opportunity for it to go into escrow for education. You know, you can use it for, uh, like everyone in your household, in public housing is eligible for it. So if your kids want to, you know, get an education, or if, the parents want to get an education first, they're able to do that. And so to me that is, that makes better sense. Because when people are able to be self-sufficient and financially stable and have opportunities for economic mobility, they actually are able to contribute to the economy uh, versus, you know, uh, increasing the amount of subsidies that are needed. And I think it's a better sort of financial model. So this is basically what we're trying to do. Um, you know, some people say, if you look at the first block, some people say, you know, give everybody the same thing. But that's assuming everybody needs the same thing and is starting from the same place, because clearly that box didn't do anything for that little guy, right? You still can't seal the fence. And in the middle, it's like filling gaps. 
just filling gaps. And people are dependent on those gaps being filled. You, you take those boxes away and they're right back where they started. And so true equity is people having the opportunity to um, achieve at their highest levels and, and, and desires, which is the third box. And so as we talk to ourselves at BMC, um, I will tell you the most difficult uh, part of making this sort of shift and transformation is mindset. It's mindset, you know, shifting from charity and filling boxes to equity. Even when you're thinking about things like, I'll tell you that a little bit about this later, but you know, when you're talking about um, in increasing or building more inclusive local economies, when you want to um, have a, an event and you need a vendor, some people have the same list of same vendors all the time. But if you really want to increase opportunities for people, think of a different vendor, a small business in a community and you give them an opportunity to, you know, for economic uh, mobility, and give them an opportunity to be financially stable. So the hardest thing is mindset. But what we are telling ourselves is, um, we have to understand why patients are, are like they are. We have to ask the question, what would it take for this to never happen again? Understand the root cause of this sort of perpetual instability. Um, and change our mindset about what's possible for people to achieve. You know, some people will say, well, you're in this socioeconomic group, and this is what people in your socioeconomic group get. And, you know, and that means you're complicit in it, you're driving it. And I mean, it's not a criticism, but it's certainly an observation. You know, if you set high bars, that's what will happen. I mean, where you set the bar becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the last thing is, again, not just filling gaps, but mitigating and eliminating them. So, we're focusing right now on these things at the bottom. And there are a lot of different uh, programs and uh, innovations that, uh, that we're trying to put in those boxes. But let me just make it clear. We are on a learning and nascent stage in this process. I mean, we are basically maybe two, barely two years. It won't be two years until March 1st. We're just getting started in this space. But the, I wanted to share some of the things with you. So one of the things we're um, doing is looking at patients who are the highest utilizers in the system. Um, you know, like 45% of our patients are responsible, no, 25% of our patients, 22% of our patients, I'm sorry, 2% of our patients are responsible for 45% of the total cost of care, 2%. And um, the profile of these patients, the number one thing is homelessness, Substance use disorder, of course, and serious mental illness. But what we, we've, we've uh, hired a big workforce of, uh, of complex care management teams that are community, what people normally call community health workers. We call them community <coughs> wellness advocates because we didn't want to call them community health workers because a lot of times, you know, people in this population have always had some kind of worker in their life, DCF worker, case worker, some kind of thing that focused on a deficit versus an asset. So we call them community wellness advocates. So they're in dyads with nurses and pharmacists. And uh, what they're doing is engaging with patients and um, you know, gaining the trust and have set, establishing a rapport. And they follow patients outside the hospital, in their homes, in the communities, um, taking them to places. And we find that if people are not homeless, we can reduce um, ER visits and hospital admissions by up to 40% can have huge impact. But when they're homeless, it's difficult to you know, move the bar at all. It's just difficult. Again, they can't prioritize these things. And even then, though, when, those, when homeless patients come in, and the people who, are, who work for like Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, which is right across the street from us, tell us one of the most important things is working with patients and focusing on what matters to them in that moment. That also has the greatest impact on whether or not they'll come back you know, to keep some continuity going with it. And I wanted to show you how engaging with patients, as I was telling you at the beginning when I was uh, starting out, um, what it can do. This was before we had the complex management teams. This is before we hired that big workforce. We were just trying, in the general internal medicine department, just trying, you know, just a little pilot. And that's just engaging with people before we had this full blown out program that we have right now. You know, what happens when you just listen to a person and 
get to understand what matters to them and what they want to deal with first. They talk about having had a person who was living in a shelter and they were trying to engage him in his um, in, in, in care, in his clinical care, and he said, you know, trying to get him to follow with his appointments and take his medicine. He was like, I'm not interested in that, I'm interested in getting a job. And once they connected him to workforce development, then he was able and ready to engage in his care. So it's really important to understand how important it is to uh, meet people where they are. This thing right here they call a utilization BKG. And it's actually short because it should go farther out that way. But the long and the short of it is, this is a guy who is uh, not that old, like 56 years old, I guess, had chronic diseases plus substance use disorder. And he was involved in um, uh, complex care management. And you saw spikes up after that, but usually it spikes up after complex care management because they are getting them to come to appointments. So that's what that counts as, not as a hospital um, admission right there. But look what happened when the guy was housed. Look at that. You know, it's amazing what it does for people. And so we are engaging people. We're screening all of our patients <coughs> in ambulatory care clinics um, where they're taking something called a Thrive Screener. It's entered into their electronic medical records. They're able to identify, and this is what the screener screens for, they're able to identify where they have gaps and uh, also identify what they want help with. And the computer spits out um, uh, a resource to connect them to, to mitigate and eliminate those gaps. We are also, and actually by doing that, we get a sense of uh, what the gaps are in general for our patient population. I will tell you that housing is right up there. Um, as a, <clears throat> a top uh, thing that people screen high for, but so is wanting employment. It screens pretty high up there as something people want help with. <clears throat> we belong to the Healthcare Anchor Network, which is a collaboration of 45 healthcare centers from across the country, including ones, big ones like um, Kaiser. And <clears throat> what it does is it focuses on building more inclusive, uh, sustainable economies through hospitals being intentional about how they make everyday decisions in three pillars, hiring, investment, and procurement. One example is the example I gave about when you need a, a specific kind of vendor. I'll give you an example of what we did in the investment arena, and I'll give you an example of what we did um, in hiring. So it basically just sets a framework to achieve sustainable local economies. Um, I will say that Hospitals cannot and should not be doing this work alone. It requires multi-sector partnerships, you know, among healthcare and um, uh, businesses and foundations and philanthropy, education, grassroots organizations, community-based organizations, and government, you know, so that we can um, leverage our assets and our strengths and, and achieve common goals. In the hiring arena, Boston Medical Center was the first hospital that signed on to the mayor's Boston Hires program. And in 2018, we hired like 400 people from the community into the hospital. The HR department also uh, just started uh, a bunch of pilots this month that are a part of a big workforce development um, push they have. Actually, they're taking patients who screen positive for wanting employment from the Thrive Screener and bringing them into this program. And two of the four different programs um, are uh, workforce development training and wraparound services with guaranteed jobs at the end. We also have a partnership with Madison Park High School, uh, the possible project, and we have kids that are like interns there every single week, um, being exposed to healthcare and potential careers. Now, um, I was talking about that government is one of the partnerships we should have. So in Massachusetts, when a hospital uh, does construction on its hospital, when it builds onto its hospital or builds a new hospital, the state says you have to get 5% of the total cost of that construction to the community. And for the first time, um, we, had, we asked a different permission of the state about that regulation. We just completed a campus redesign. We had to spend six and a half million dollars. And we asked the state if we could commit our obligation to multiple different types of housing projects. And the, the state granted us uh, a yes for that. And we created like nine different um, projects. And I want to give absolute um, 
Great credit to my partner in this work, Dr. Megan Sandel, who's a pediatrician at BMC. And, um, you know, housing has been her thing for quite some time. And um, I won't tell you about all nine of the projects, but I'll tell you about one of them. So one of the things we did was we invested in a, um, uh, a private equity fund. And this is the kind of uh, equity fund that will only fund developments that provide access to affordable housing, employment, green walking space, transit, and healthy, affordable foods. And our contribution to that investment is um, contributing to what is now becoming um, 323 units of new housing, some to own, some to rent. It's multi-level um, uh, you know, multi housing, mixed income housing, and 70% uh, of the laborers on the construction site actually come from the community. And the people in the community said they wanted a grocery store in that site or at that site. And we were able to help a grocery store that's basically based in DC. Um, we were able to help them to mitigate the cost of expansion by giving them a no interest loan. A no interest loan. You know, and it's, and it's that sort of like creativity that you do to get things moving. Um, and uh, they came, they will be in that space right there. It's called Good Foods Markets. We also um, established, with that same determination of need, uh, six and a half million, something called the Innovative Stable Housing Initiative. And uh, what that did was, again, we established these three funding streams and two other hospitals who had greater DON obligations than us. Like we had six and a half million to spend, one of them had 53.4 million to spend. But two other hospitals joined us and uh, invested with us in this funding stream in this Innovative Stable Housing Initiative, which we call ISHI. There's another hospital also that is about to join. And uh, you know we're leveraging that as a, it's a pretty good precedent for what's actually possible you know, to achieve. Nobody ever thought hospitals in Boston would be doing something like that. And to take it to another level, every, um, every uh, three years, the, the Affordable Care Access Hospitals have to conduct a community health needs assessment and an improvement plan based on what you find in the needs assessment. And last year, 2019, for the very first time in Boston, the hospitals did a uh, community health needs assessment together. And um, it was amazing. But we you know, created a governance and all this stuff to create this thing. And what came out of it in terms of um, the needs were, and the things we identified as a part of the improvement plan we'll work on, are housing, finance, and economic mobility, access to life services, and the fourth thing is behavioral health. But the two we will really be working hard on in the next two years are housing, and finance and economic mobility. So um, that too set a pretty strong precedent for what's possible. And uh, last, we belong to something called the Center for Community Investment. There are only six hospitals in the country that uh, were chosen to do this, and we actually, you know, you apply to get into it. And like always, it's always like these big healthcare systems and little tiny BMC, you know, among them. And um, just like, you know, not afraid and kind of bold and just go for it. Um, and uh, it's been amazing because it has forced us and helped us to be creative and think about how you actually put together deals to create, to create housing. So it's, uh, it's been great. It's a lot of work. You go to these things two or three times a year. Um, and, um, and they just like burn your brain until there's nothing left but ash. <laughs> Seriously, all day long. It's like really, really, really challenging. So um, that's what I wanted to share with you this evening. And um, I hope it gives you some insight into, first of all, the imperative for you know, this transformation. And also uh, what's possible you know, to be able to achieve. And again, you know, we have deep analytics on, in this space, which is so exciting. And, um, you know, over the next three years or so, it'll be interesting to see um, how things turn out. So thank you so much. So Dr. James is open to answering questions. And please, please, please ask, ask your questions. 
So we hired somebody uh, at BMC to be the vice president of a particular department um, maybe a year ago. And you know, when a new vice president comes on, they go around and meet all the vice presidents. And when, uh, when he came to me, uh, and I was telling him about what we were doing and trying to do, and he's looking at me, he's like, what do people say when you say that stuff? And I was like, hey, look at me like you are. That's <laughs> really funny. But, um, uh, yeah, I think they're getting it. I mean, like Kaiser, for example, they invested like two hundred million dollars in housing. So um, you know, I think it's spreading around. But I also want to say, and I can't say this enough, you know, um, you know, housing is a big deal. But I also feel like the economic mobility piece and financial stability—that stuff—is equally important. Because if people had that, housing would not be an issue. You know, as much of an issue as it is. You know, so. I think they're both, they're both important. And people talk about different domains, like they talk about education and food and these type things. Well, uh, you know, financial independence is the only thing that will take care of all those things. So I think it's equally important. And the other thing I can't stop saying enough is we have to be careful not to re, um, recreate, you know, the traps and things like that that have already been created. We can easily do that. Particularly when you're thinking about something like housing. You can just be warehousing people. You're just moving them from one place to the next. And that's what public housing was doing like back in the day. Just warehousing people. That's where all these big public housing, you know, park projects and things, that's what they did. So we really, really, really have to be careful about that. Thank you. Um, I love the work on housing. I'm a board member in Pine Street. So, ah, so you know my boss, I, Kay Walsh. Yeah, yeah, I do. I know Kay. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, one of the hurdles on, on housing is always nimbyism, right? People love the idea of housing, but they don't want it in their community. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Experiences of, 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 of problems in suburbs where so they don't love. want these people or in the city, it, it, it's always a hurdle. Everyone wants something, but they don't want to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the zoning laws are a perfect example of that, I think, you know, where they don't want certain density uh, in the suburb zone. I heard something, I don't know if it was yesterday, I went to uh, a housing event down at the uh, Federal Reserve Building, and someone was talking about something is shifting a little bit to re relax the zoning laws a little bit around density. So there may be some, you know, uh, something about, uh, you know, beginning to happen, but that's something that we need to lean on constantly all the time. That's another form of redlining, exactly, you know, really. It truly is, you know, keeping people out of a place. I mean, uh, for folks that don't know, every city or town has to pay attention to what they call the 40B law. You can look up any city or town. Newton does not meet its criteria. We're sitting here in Newton. Um, it's, it's something that gets pushed under the rug so that, that what you're talking about is a different kind of red line. Yeah. It's a major policy issue that we have to keep pushing against. Hi. Um, I have a question from like a physician perspective. I'm in the emergency room environment, I know it's like very hectic and you were talked about a lot about like listening to a patient and like really like understanding their story. Um, how, what advice do you have um, from a medical perspective to like incorporate that into like such a busy environment? Like how they like take the time and like listen to a patient's story and try to find like, the background and the underlying yeah. problem? Well, emergency, emergency departments is just like organized chaos. Yeah. <laughs> really, I mean, there's a whole lot going on around you. I mean, sometimes I laugh at my, I laugh because I'll be sitting at a computer and there's like 
all kinds of stuff going on around me. You know, people yelling, table falling, all kinds of stuff. And you just keep doing what you do. <laughs> you know, because, you know, you've got to, like, focus on what you're doing. And so I think it's the exact same thing when you have a patient. I mean, the most important thing to me, and it's clear, so clear to me why I love my job. I've always loved my job. I mean, becoming a doctor was, without question, the best decision I ever made in my life. Is because there's such a reward waiting for you. Every single time you just like get to sit there and just like you can't wait to shift that person's perspective, you know. And so the most important thing is to achieve that. And a lot of times they'll do things like say, "Oh, that's a Thea patient. Let's go get Thea to talk to that patient," oh, you know, <laughs> things like that. Because they don't want to like take the time or whatever. Yeah. And it's, and I love it when there's somebody they can't they think is being unruly. Yeah. And I just walk over to him and I say, you know, you look kind of happy, you know, what can, what can we do to help you? And, and they'll start, um, you know, whatever they're complaining about, and I just acknowledge them, like, yeah, I don't blame you. You know, I feel upset too. And like, but I'm here now, what can we do? You know, what, what would it take? And so they just want to be heard and, and acknowledge, that's all. But it's great, it's a great job. <laughs> it really is. Hey, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, Jim O'Connell, who's the director of the Boston Empirical Books program right, right across the street, um, yep. in his book he talks about this phenomenon that he's experienced where um, healthcare providers who work with uh, like marginalized populations are marginalized within the healthcare community in terms of they're not sort of seen as the best and most elite uh, healthcare providers, um, which is a really interesting phenomenon. And I think the work that you presented is almost the hospital level equivalent of that. Because that, I know someone asked about sort of physicians responding to this, but have other peer institutions besides the two you showed, um, you know, is there a growing movement among Boston hospitals to follow, strive with you guys? Is Absolutely. Who, yeah. Oh, yeah. That slide I showed you, uh, well, listen, um, the thing I didn't show you, that slide with all the different hospitals on it, we also have a social determinants of health collaborative that was ad hoc. We just formed that on our own in 2017. Um, and uh, just so we could begin to like learn from each other and figure out you know what was the best path forward and um, so people are actually definitely shifting that way I mean and the insurance companies are kind of like making you have no choice not only Medicaid there are other insurance companies that are have these sort of pay for performance type reimbursement models as well so you know you're actually you have a financial imperative to do it even if you don't believe in it you have to do something so um, uh, yeah, it's definitely definitely shifting, for sure. Um, thank you very much. Um, I've always had a lot of respect for like, my coworkers like you, especially now. I think it's very a very interesting time to be in your field, especially with like the outbreak of like the coronavirus in the city of Wuhan. Um, I just want to ask, like, what's your like opinion on that? Like, as um, a professional who works in the medical field, if it ever like spreads to Boston, like how would hospital and the health um, systems here in Massachusetts like would cope with that problem? Trust me, we trained for that stuff. <laughs> we trained for that. We definitely trained. You know, it's really funny. I was laughing about this. Uh, so uh, I mean, laughing only because I'm like how fast things change. So you know, even when like Ebola, you know, was happening. You know, we train, you know, we turn, you know, we put on these protective, you know, gear. We train to do that, to put that stuff on, to take it off. We have uh, protocols for how we manage patients who come in. You know, we have a whole area for um, decontamination for people. We have one just like at the beginning of the ER that's sort of, you know, cut off from everything else. We have these tents we can put out front. We've already been trained for the coronavirus thing. And what I was laughing about was, Last Friday, we have these um, VP operations meetings every Friday, and somebody was giving a report, the chief medical officer was giving a report on, you know, what's going on with coronavirus, and, and then somebody was saying, well, yeah, yeah, well, you know, we don't have any cases in America yet. And like this week, like how many do we have? Like three or five or something, I mean, so it changes pretty quickly, but we train for this stuff. And that's how come uh, we did so well for the Boston uh, Marathon bombings as well. It was like a play, almost. It's like the ER was doing its usual kind of thing, what you're doing on that day. I was working that day, and somebody from the finish line, one of our docs, because our docs work 
you know, the tents and the finish lines. And this person called and say, she said, hey, TJ. She was like, something happened down here. Sounds like some, some explosion or whatever, but we might get a few, just so you know. Then we got this official thing on the radio. And you know, you go to a play, and they go through different acts, and the curtain closes, and then it opens back up, and it's a different scene. That's exactly how it was. Just like that, you know, everybody, the, 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 the ER just, tra just transformed. What you do is move all the people out of the ER who are not urgent or emergent, and they put them upstairs someplace, and you, the whole, it's like a stage, and all the furniture and everything just changes. But I have to, so, so we're always preparing for, for, these, for these things, these disasters and things, and we do it together, even, you know, with the different hospitals. So we're all, we're already, we all are always, you know, ready for those types of things. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. You work in areas that are not Boston uh, for emergencies. Can you tell us something about uh, working here and trying to transform healthcare context here and being in New Orleans after Katrina or oh. being Haiti yeah. after the earthquake? So right. completely different context right. where you go and you are on a mission, and, and then you bring your expertise, but then you come back and you did them there. Yeah. So if you can help us to see how these two very different types of engagement to promote health. Right, so I've done different types of global health. Um, so the disasters that I went to, I was a part of, the, I just actually stepped down recently. The Disaster Medical Assistance Team, DMAT, is a part of, it's a, we're federalized, you know, we're part of the, um, federal system. And so and that's another thing we train for. We train heavily, train a lot for that. And so there's real strict protocols for everything. It's almost like being in the military. And so we go to these places. Um, for example, your bag is always packed. You know, because when they call you, you got like an hour and a half, two hours to like get to where the bus is leaving to take you to the airport. And so, um, uh, you know, it's a disaster protocol. When you get to these places, I was telling the group earlier, there's a disaster protocol about, you know, you see patients and you label them by colors, you know, like red, black, green, yellow. And, um, you know, some people are not salvageable and some people are extremely sick and then some are walking wounded and some fall in between there. Some are seriously, are serious, but you can, do, you can get, you can put resources in them and they'll survive. So there's, that's a strict protocol. You do the same thing everywhere. The only difference is you don't know where you're gonna like be living. You know, so we get on a plane, a plane, we take our hospital with us. We even take like trucks, like SUVs and things on the planes, like a lot of times the military planes. Then when we get there, we build the hospital. You know, it's like an urgent care, an ER, an OR, a wound tent and you know it's like match I mean we're just out there like you know doing these things um, but you don't know where you're gonna sleep like you, you may not have a shower for two weeks literally and you know you eat these meals ready to eat and that type of stuff which I was never really good at. I couldn't eat that stuff um, <laughs> seriously, you know or you, you have like um, you know when I came back from Iran people were like oh my god you look darker and thinner and I was like, yeah, that's all right. There's a lot of stuff there, and, uh, and I don't eat when I do these things. Um, but, um, so that's one thing. And then, but the other global health I've done in other countries, we're always third world countries, and, um, and it's always about what the people there identify as a need they have, and we always try to make it something that's sustainable. Like, people will donate ultrasound machines to places, and the people there don't know how to use them. And so we use ultrasound, and the ultrasound is a subspecialty in emergency medicine now. So we uh, go there and train people and things like that. And train, you know, depending on what it, what it is they say they want. Um, and so it's like two, two different kinds of things. It's amazing how your mind turns on and off, turn and off. When I started doing the administrative stuff, um, like I do most of the administration now, I still work in the ER two days a month, people say, um, God, it must be better than working in the ER. I was like, no, the ER was easy. <laughs> that was easy. You could, I could go in there, I can walk through the ER and look at people and like, yep, they have that, they have that, that person got that. I can tell by the way they walk or 
the way they're moving around on the bed. You know, I know if it's a gallstone, if it's a kidney stone, you just know. You know, and so, uh, but this administrative stuff we're dealing with people. Oh my God! <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. There's somebody right there. Hi, thank you. But um, I, I was lucky enough to work on this community development for mixed income housing in South Boston. And I just have a question where, in looking at specific like, integrated housing initiatives that have like the greatest intentions, yet sometimes we still see that they have like unintended <coughs> consequences where like for that just magnified disparities. I just have the question like how do you mitigate these attempts that like are rooted in good intentions yet still like can lead to like Yeah, be intentional. Think about it, you know, think about it before you do it and involve the people you're creating it for in the process because they will tell you what they need to thrive. Um, but it, it requires, you know, real intentionality to think about these things. And listen, every single day at work now, I'm, I'm constantly like changing a word in something somebody wrote, just a single word. It's like, nope, don't put that word there because that means that you know, or people say, oh, well, you're giving them agency. I'm like, no, they have agency. They just need people to get out of the way and give them an opportunity. <laughs> They've got agency. So it's just like mindset and just being intentional about those things because we're just so used to, you know, doing it. But, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, um, so I grew up in the D.C. area. And when I grew up, you know, D.C. was like 70% African American. And, you know, the federal government is an enormous economic anchor for that, that, that geographic area, D.C., Maryland, Virginia. So I grew up seeing predominantly people of color and people of color thriving. You know, I did, that's just what I grew up seeing. Um, but when, you know, I don't care where you are on the economic spectrum, if you're a person of color, it is really, really almost near impossible for you not to understand the whole spectrum, even if it's never been your life. Somehow, you kind of know it. You do, you know it, even if it's not been your life. You're aware of it. And so, um, I don't know how that happens, but um, it's things like that that prevent you from doing the kind of things you just ask about, because you just kind of, you just kind of know. And I think it's also the thing that's always, at, you know, made me ask patients, get, get the whole story from patients, and always question what's happening with them and not making assumptions, but just, you know, letting them tell me. Somebody? Either one. Hi. Yes. Hi, Althea. I don't know if you remember me, but... Uh, I do. My, my sister, Laurie. Yes. You know, she still works at Boston Medical. My my father-in-law, Robin, worked at BS and my sister. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, and I've watched you as a young superstar for 30 years. Oh. I tried to get off Boston PD and came over here. My job when I left was um, the liaison to BHA um, from the oh. Boston Police Department. Okay. And um, at some point, I think the city of Boston decided that we couldn't arrest our way out of some yep. of the issues and that we were going to sell out. Uh, so I'm well aware of the fact that Boston Housing now is basically trying to get out of the business of housing. So, such as in Charlestown, they sold the property to Corbin and Jennings, Lenox Street area that I worked in for over 25 years, so to be in properties. Um, Bromley Heath has recently sold 15 or so, or so buildings, crime right on Center Street that is going to Urban Edge, I believe. Oh, wow. That's so they're getting out of the business of housing. And while I was there at Boston, I would have a lot of people come up to me in tears who were told that they were going to be getting vouchers, but didn't know where to go, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. And I love what you're saying, and I love the effort that is being put in by these smaller agencies on the background, right? But it seems to me that we're dealing with band-aids and our operations, right? Yep. The city is clearly going into a different direction, right? Yep. And when they take over these properties, such as in Charleston, in Charleston, they're going to knock down all the property that happens to be on Bunker Hill Ave, because that's prime real estate for market house. Right. In Center Street, they're going to 
take down the one on Center Street. Yep. And they want to build places in the back where the residents can live in the back, a few that get to stay, right? So it's the beginning of the end of housing as we know it, and the beginning of you know, gentrification for these housing plans. Um, but a couple other things were like the crack, at, the crack epidemic, right? And which still plans the black community, right? Mm -hmm. Like every single one of the developments I was in, right? right? And of course, it's never been talked about by anybody, including sadly the governor, right? Who talks a lot about the heroin epidemic, but right. you know, not the crack epidemic. Right, that's right. So, so when I go back and I still do a lot of, I still work a lot of programs, I still work with Bronte Heath, I still work <coughs> a couple of programs. But when we go back and we talk to these people, like what do we say to them at the sign of hope, right? Because the South End that I grew up in no longer exists. No longer exists. Right. My children don't want to live in the South End anymore. I don't go back to the South End anymore because I can't afford to even go back to my home. Right. So what do we tell to these people who are born to believe in and have no place to live? Well, I mean, you know, the mayor apparently has this big plan, you know, of, of having, what is it, like 5,000 or something like that, some enormous number to end homelessness by whatever year, yeah, 2030. Um, and, you know, there's not enough, you know, enough places to put people. Um, I kind of feel like they can solve it, but like you said, they're doing this on one hand and doing something else on the other. Um, I think they can solve it. I really do think they can solve it, um, but they have to solve it. They will solve it if they um, identify opportunities that increase people's ability to be self-sufficient, not just looking for housing. And when they talk about housing, that's kind of like when they talk about housing. They don't really talk about the self-sufficiency you know, self piece. But the way I sort of like live through most of this stuff is I just ask people, and I'm just, you know, just grateful that we do have things to offer people. You know, these days, there is a long list and all of that, but, you know, we're doing a lot of um, work with other developments, uh, neighborhood development corporations and other developments that are developers that I didn't even mention um, in here, um, just trying to create something for them. But I will say, it always, you know, it's always like listening to people, just let them get it out, that's how I feel about it, and understanding, you know, giving them opportunities to, like, work and stuff like that, or, um, because they are moving out, that's for sure. You know, they can't, you know, nobody can afford to, to live here. I just can't bear to see people suffering, you know. Um, but for me, you know, it's always just listening to them and what matters to them. And, you know, a lot of times I ask people in the ER, what would it take for you to leave here today and feel like you got what you came for? I would, I would just ask them that, you know, particularly when I don't know, you know, I can't, like, it's not clear to me why they're there to begin with, you know. Um, and I will ask people things like that. And you know what? You'd be surprised. It's not always insurmountable. It really isn't. Sometimes it's just, uh, you know, allowing them to, like, talk to you and uh, get them in a different space, a more, you know, a more positive space somehow. But it's going to take uh, everybody. It's going to take a lot of people. The only thing I worry about, honestly, is people not being able to shift their mindset appropriately. That's what I worry the most about. Because it'll never change until you know, we're able to do that. Can you do another here in the center? Hi there. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so, so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, you had mentioned that uh, over and above housing um, as one of the major obstacles um, for this, this epidemic, uh, that financial independence was even more, or just as important. I wanted to ask um, what, uh, and that you also mentioned that working with government was um, imperative for actually um, bringing about change. What policies or um, proposals do you think um, could bring about financial independence for, for everyone? And what, um, what backlash or what sort of um, problems you, could you foresee government advocates um, Presenting. Well, I mean, I think one of them is like changing some of these like welfare to work kind of crazy business things like um, when they create these policies for people, uh, you know, like taking away, you know, like not just making somebody work because you think that they shouldn't be living on subsidies and doing nothing. Because when you say you must work 20 hours a week, and just leave it at that, you're still doing nothing. If you know, you're able to engage 
with people and give them like meaningful things to do that will be life transformative, you know, altering their life course, that's one thing. You know, policies to disrupt the structural barriers that create those types of things. The other thing is just lifting this whole notion of limiting how much money people can earn to live in subsidies. They do really crazy things. You earn like 57 cents over what the limit is and you can lose your childcare. But if you lose your child care, you can't go to work. I mean, it's just nonsensical. It does, just doesn't make any sense at all. I think if they would just lift some of these like ridiculous policies against poor people, you know, and people who don't have the resources that every that other people have, I think it would make a huge difference. Huge difference. And those are the kind of things that create like violence in communities and things like that. I mean, there's no way out. And these kids' tattoos that I used to read in the trauma rooms, I mean, they just like told the story. They're just like hopeless. And so, um, you know, I think we do it to ourselves. I mean, from the perspective of government, for example. Sure. Again, thanks for your presentation. Thanks for coming and being with us tonight. Um, I was struck by two things in your talk. Uh, a couple of things I really learned. One was um, the different sources of financing for things like complex care management and the, and the various programs. And I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit more about that. I was, I was impressed with the, uh, the the mandate that when new hospital construction takes place, that that requires an investment in the strategies that BMC is taking. And the other is just um, maybe to, to hold up for the students here in particular, that people who have um, access to investment funds really can do good social impact things. Absolutely. I think most of us are, are uh, socialized into thinking that people who have a lot of wealth are just going to invest it to make greater profit. Right. And, and um, I, I thought some of the examples you gave, if you wanted to maybe add some more examples of how people have made decisions uh, to invest in things like uh, uh, the, other, the, 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 the upstream factors yeah. uh, for health, health outcomes. Yeah, so um, I forgot the first part of your question. But well, the first part was just some of the sources of income. You mentioned a couple of things like uh, hospitals when they're doing construction, investing in right. things, but other kinds of sources of income for these kinds of programs. Well, that was kind of like an unusual one, you know, quite frankly, because nobody had ever asked the state if they could do, do use it for that. You know, most times people are just for, you know, we required to do these community benefits and things like that. I mean, honestly, people just like do what they do to check the box to make sure they, you know, uh, you know, met the mandate. But, um, you know, it's more about these days like altering, altering, you know, the, the life course of people. Um, in terms of that investment piece, uh, and that's part of what the healthcare open network does is do T, now that's only three years old. And so doing TA, technical assistance and stuff like, how do you present these pillars to your hospital? How do you talk to your CEO about it? That money would have never come off of our, our books, you know, our operating budget. That would have never happened. Had it not been for that determination of need obligation, that wouldn't have happened. It may happen now that we've been socializing it more and more and other hospitals are talking about it more. I mean, like the treasurer of another hospital um, is now saying, you know, we can invest in these private equity things, but we have to be willing to uh, uh, take a lower return a little lower, a little slower, you know, in terms of the percent you get back. The Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund was, a, I think, 8% return. Um, and it takes a little bit longer. Um, and other people, you know, don't have to be as creative as us. They have more money, you know, than we do. And you're right about impact investing. You know, that's a, a, another opportunity. But again, you have to be willing to accept um, lower returns and, and things like that. Um, those examples that I gave you are some of the ones I know about, like in what we've done in Boston. Um, in other cities, it's been like Kaiser, who invested $200 million, you know, just in, 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 in housing itself. Um, maybe partnerships with people like Google, 
was putting in like 500 million, I believe, in California. And so, uh, but we are talking to, like I said, we're in the nascent stages of this, and we're working on various different mechanisms and opportunities um, to invest. So in the uh, CCI thing, here's another example. And this is really like, you know, like making a quilt. So one of the things we've created to get access to housing is using vouchers that are associated with, you can get access to housing with this voucher, but only if the voucher is paired with um, services with a healthcare system. And so we've been able to like create, we're working on that right now, working on um, deals where it's possible to work with. I think we have four developers that we're working with, and um, one of the housing authorities, these 811 vouchers, we're using those, for example, were not getting used. And so uh, one of, we talked with one of the housing authorities who like put out an RFP, and the developers applied for those vouchers. And then we're working with those developers that has potential to create um, some units for us. You know, so just using like creative things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, you, we, it doesn't cost us anything other than to provide the services. And even then, I keep warning us, those services, make sure you're doing different services with a different intention. Not just making sure people pay their rent on time or chasing behind people who don't. But you know, giving them opportunities to take it up to another level in terms of self-sufficiency and financial independence, that type of thing. So that's 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 one example of you know ways in which we're doing that. We we created a steering committee that was made up of people from foundations and people from um, uh, CDFIs, you know, community development investment uh, financial uh, corporations, like just multi-sector types of deals we're just sort of like trying to put together. I wish we had the kind of like operating budgets and, and coffers like, you know, other hospitals in town. You know, I think we could, here's another thing. You could commit like 1% of your total revenue, for example, to this type of investment in those three pillars. That's another creative way. And that's what the Healthcare Anchor Network asks you know, people to do. Um, we made that commitment, but only through DON, the only through determination of need. And so, um, you know, we're, 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 we're just trying to socialize the notion that you can just take, if you have a pie, you have your investment portfolio, you know, a sliver of that can be for this type of work. Because the, the impact overall, over time, is just so great. You don't have to have like this, and this other 12% like, return kind of a thing with nothing else, mm -hmm. not having any impact on people. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you for your presentation, and I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I, don't, I can't see the, oh, there we go, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and I uh, appreciate it. Uh, this may come out as a little bit personal, but what would be your uh, own motivation of doing this type of uh, very demanding, complicated work? Uh, it's interesting. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, um, it's challenging. You get to disrupt stuff um, and, uh, and and be innovative, and you get to alter people's life course. You know, that's 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 really the motivation. It really is, and to see people's lives just change. You know, I didn't, I didn't talk a, a little, a, a lot about this, but um, you know, we, the proof of concept for this for me is, we have a violence intervention program that started in 2006, and these young people will come in with gunshot wounds and stab wounds, and most people think of them as like, I don't know, they don't think, they think of them as bad people, and it's only, they stigmatize them because of the in nature of the injury. And um, I would read these kids' tattoos that said, like, born to be hated, dying to be loved, death is hard, no, living is hard, dying is easy. Um, death is nothing but to live defeated is to die every day. And I was like, these kids are the exact opposite of what people think they are, of who people think they are, they were just hopeless. And, um, at that time, uh, there weren't that many hospital-based violence intervention programs, and 
I was telling the group earlier that one hospital was beginning to publish on their program, and they were publishing best practices and measures of success. And their measures of success, they were measuring things like re-injury, re-incarceration, dropped out of school. And it just was, just made no sense to me. I couldn't understand what their objective was, what was their goal, what were they trying to achieve? And so I, I just decided, you know, it was a combination of reading the tattoos and listening to the case conferences every week. And I was thinking, you know, all these same quantitative data about these young people, there's no context to it. And uh, the first study we did was a qualitative one, but the long story short was, I said, you know what? I don't see any reason why we shouldn't set the goals for these kids that we set for ourselves. So we'll set really high bars, because wherever we set it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we have amazing outcomes for those kids. We have like a housing track, we have a workforce development track, we have um, every, every single person who comes in with an injury like that is, has one of our uh, advocates, they have a family advocate, their advocate, housing advocate, workforce advocate. So those kids come out with like jobs, some in BMC, some outside BMC. I was telling the group earlier how they just transformed over time. You know, you see them when they start out, they may be working as a cashier in the, one of the cafeterias at BMC, and next time you see them, they might have on a shirt and a bow tie, because they got a different job in the hospital. Um, one kid, um, uh, was a gamer. He just loved gaming. And at first he had a job in uh, housekeeping, which I never wanted them to have. I just told them it's not good for them to work in housekeeping. These like, these like black males, you know, from these communities don't, be, don't need to be, but it's just, you, you have no idea. You, I can't even explain it to you, but they should not be working there. But anyways, he saw a, uh, a, a friend of his on a gurney dead one time, and he quit. And so, but we kept working with him, working with him, and he was such a gamer. We just like got him hooked up into this program sponsored by Google. Long story short, um, we got him into this internship um, where he was working with these, uh, this couple who, has, uh, who runs a computer company where they set up websites and things for people. Anyway, I saw uh, the, one, of the, one of the owners of that company, I saw him this past summer, and I asked him, I was like, how's this kid? I actually was gonna show you guys a video of him earlier, but anyways, I asked him, I was like, how's this kid? They were, oh, he's gone, he's got his own company. You know, he's like, <laughs> I was like, wow. You know, so it's that kind, that kind of thing. You know, we have some that have, you know, college degrees. I was telling the other group, I have uh, uh, one with an MBA, another one that's graduated and they with, with her MBA. I mean, it's like those kind of goals. And so to me, that was proof of concept that we could translate something like that to all of our patients, not just those patients. And so, and I felt like if we could do it with them because they are so distrusting and you know, don't believe you know, that anybody's trying to help them, I, I felt like we could do it with pretty much anybody. Thank you, Dr. James.